Right, because it's all about understanding someone else's perspective, being curious about them. What do they care about? Because who do you like to talk to? Right, people who are interested in you, who are curious about what you're facing, what you're experiencing, what you're up against, what you like to watch on TV, what you like to do in your free time, what you're passionate about. Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I have Brian Burns with us, and we're going to be talking about winning in sales, why emotional intelligence matters. Brian, welcome to Outside Sales Talk. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. So by way of introduction, Brian has 20 years of experience in sales. He's been, uh, he specialized in selling enterprise software and currently works with leadership teams to help create and dominate their market segments. He also is the host of two podcasts in the top 15 in business on iTunes, which are the the B2B Revenue Leadership Show and the brutal truth about selling, the brutal truth about sales and selling. He's also the author of four books on B2B sales, including The Maverick Sale, Selling Method. <laughs> I can't talk today. The Maverick Selling Method, Simplifying the Complex Sale. Um, Brian, uh, first question. Um, you talk about emotional intelligence a lot. What is emotional intelligence or EI in the context of sales and why is it important? Yeah, I mean, it is really the things that salespeople need to focus on because we, we think about knowing the market, uh, business acumen, knowing the product. But what we really need to do is know ourselves and know our clients. Too often we're stuck in our own head thinking that it's our job to sell. It must be someone else's job to buy. It's no one's job to buy our product. <laughs> we have to connect with other human beings. And no one teaches emotional intelligence, or what I call the outward mindset, which kind of like expands on emotional intelligence. Because emotional intelligence is both internal stuff, regulating your mood, uh, the meaning that you give things, rejection, uh, ambivalence, uh, pressure, all the things that we face in sales. Those are hard to manage. And they blind us to what we really should be doing. And that is connecting with another human being, empathizing with them, being curious about their world and what they're going through, instead of just that we have to make a certain number by the end of the month. Absolutely. And everybody talks about IQ. How does EQ or um, EI or EQ, uh, how does it stack up against IQ? Is one more important than the other in sales or... Uh, or, or is one really the, uh, are they equally important? Well, you don't really find that many super IQ people in sales. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're brilliant, Brian. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, if, if you're acing your SATs and, you know, reading comes naturally to you and equations kind of are the way you think, you're probably not getting into sales. People fall into sales one or two reasons. They either can't do anything else or they're money motivated. So you might find somebody with super IQ and money motivated, but you know, EQ, the ability to connect with another human being uh, is something that we're not born with. It's just the opposite, right? All we, we're born with the, the need, selfish need to eat, sleep, and that's about it, right? And a couple of other things. And we grow up and we're not really socialized to it. I think women are much more socialized to guys. You know, I, I don't remember watching The Sopranos where AJ gives his mother the matrix for her birthday. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> that is a low <laughs> EI moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, thanks. I was hoping for this, right? And, and that's kind of how we are kind of socialized. And, you know, maybe in college, we kind of get it because we have to live with someone else that we don't know. 
we're met with a bunch of people that we don't know and we have to uh, become friends with them quickly. But then we get in the work world and especially today, we get scripts and KPIs and activities that have nothing to do with connecting with another human being. There, there's something right there that I think is so important and that is that emotional intelligence can be learned. Um, can you tell me how does one go about learning emotional intelligence? How do you sharpen that sword? Um, where do you start? It's, it's hard because like the internal part about being self-aware, I don't know if you've ever noticed a salesperson that just talks too much, talks over people, doesn't hear what's being said and just expresses their needs and their opinions. Mm -hmm. That's hard. You know, I had a rep one time where I go, look, you just got to stop talking. <laughs> well, you know, my, I had I had a sales manager when I was early in my career, and we'd be on a phone call, and he would, he would just like tap mute when I was about to talk and go listen, listen, and then he would unmute it. <laughs> Powerful tool. And how do you learn that? Well, you know, the market teaches us. We get feedback all the time. But we have to have some kind of epiphany, whether it's our income or lost deal, that says like, well, maybe it's me. Maybe I could be better. And too often I talk to sales reps and they're like, what will I learn? What will I know? And I ask, do you ever play a sport? You know, you know guys definitely have a sport. Uh, you know, other people, you ever play an instrument? You ever cook? You have a passion? I go, you know how to do it, right? You learn how to do it in an hour become good at it takes a lifetime. You know, I've been playing chess since I was a kid, you know, last week an eight year old beat me, right? <laughs> I know how to play chess. <laughs> I can become better. right? Yeah. Well, and I think everyone has some level of emotional intelligence, but it's, it's, it's a, a, a skill that for salespeople is so important and it's so hard often when you've lost a sale or something's gone wrong or a sales cycle took longer than it should have because you didn't build the trust that you could have. It's hard to point to that moment where, because you're just kind of behaving like you and you might not realize I'm not putting myself in their shoes enough or I'm not emotionally aware enough or I'm not, I'm not aware that that last objection of theirs frustrated me and now I'm talking over them a little bit or being a little more aggressive. It's, it's hard to learn these subtleties, but like Very you say, hard. I think it's a, these are things that anyone can get better at and it's not just going to help you in your sales career. It's going to help you in relationships with friends, with spouses, etc. We're used to just fighting and killing each other. We're not used to communicating and working together. And Absolutely. these things are not taught. They're assumed. We just, and you look at all the friction in society. Every human conflict is about the inability to understand someone else's position. You get cut off in traffic. Do you think that they purposely got up this morning going, Steve's, I'm going to cut him off today. I can't <laughs> wait to see him on the 101. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're like, they're like in a hurry and there's a little bit of an opening that's a little bit smaller than it should be and they go for it and you're, you feel offended, right? You get onto an airline, an airplane. You ever notice the line isn't exactly uniform? It's kind of like this uh, funnel where people just go in and it's like edging each other. Think of every human conflict. Is anybody 100% wrong? No, it's like a little bit of stuff that gets escalated and all of a sudden adrenaline hormones take over and it goes crazy. Emotional intelligence and the outward mindset is taking a step back, cutting the other person a break and understanding what they're going through. Right? And I'm sure you see it as a CEO all the time, what the board thinks and what the employees think. You know, they want all these benefits and stuff. And it's like, well, we've got to get revenue. Revenue comes in, everything works out. Revenue <laughs> doesn't come in, things get a little sketchy. <laughs> and that, that's, that's the thing. It's, Eric Schmidt had a famous quote about that. You know, the old CEO of Google, he was, it was, uh, revenue solves all problems. <laughs> it does. Like, oh, we have problems. Well, revenue, more revenue would solve that problem. <laughs> yeah. And, and when salespeople, you know, when they take the time to go and learn what they're, ideal customer does all day, right? In your case, salespeople. 
you came from a sales background. It's easy for you. Early in my career, I sold to software engineers. I was a software engineer. I could get the technical sale really easily. I knew what they were up against. I knew the words that they used. I know what their day was like. I know what their value system was. But then I was selling a million dollar piece of software. And then I had to go talk to an executive and I tell them how great it works and how this thing, this function, they could care less. They're like, why am I doing this? I don't know your company. You have no brand recognition. Do you have any customers? It doesn't matter. We can do this 10 times faster. They didn't know what that meant. They're know. like, is it slow it is. right now? <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. They're, they're, they're billing 80 hours a week, but that's cheaper than buying your hardware right now. But it won't be in six months. And, you know, so I, I think this is so important. You, you're talking about adapting um, your emotional intelligence and adapting your behavior to different situations. Um, tell, tell me about different types of situations and different ways you would adapt your EI to those situations, like uh, executive versus the, the, the software engineer that you're selling to as, a, as, a, as a, who are your yeah. customers, or maybe a, maybe an, a, an in-person meeting versus a cold call. Um, a lot of people are, in, in today's economy, changing the way they were approaching customers or prospects, and so they need to kind of rethink their, how they're doing that, and, and I think right. I, I'd love to hear your I, thoughts I help on that. Rep help reps with this because you know the cold calling its effectiveness has gone down pretty quickly over the last decade you get caller id you got cell phones uh people don't pick up their phone so you got that part of it but even when you get them all everyone teaches you know to talk about you the value you add to them but they're not open minded you know there's probably two or three things in your life right now that I could cold call you about that you'd be interested in, right? Maybe you need something repaired at your house. Maybe you need looking for a new car, new TV, new clothes, trip, vacation, whatever. You might be in market, but if mm -hmm. you're not, what, what's the likelihood of me taking you from unaware and uninterested to interested and curious? It's, it's really pretty hard. small. Yeah. yeah. But, if we're having a conversation, I was talking to a rep today and his new opener is like, Jesus, I just moved back with my parents. It's a nightmare. Right. And every client just cracks up because that must be a disaster. <laughs> Everyone can have everyone's got parents. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My, when, uh, when, when my parents come and visit me for a little while, that's uh, just, just, for, just a week seems like enough living with them. That'd be, Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, as my brother says, after two days, it's like fish, right? It's like it starts to smell. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but, I, but I've taught people, if you talk about what they care about, what they're passionate about, and it takes a little bit of research, a little bit of digging, a little bit of humility, you can find something that they care about. I got uh, one of my students in the, in the course uh, in a conversation with the CEO of Delta in 30 minutes. Okay. So wow. he, they just, they just announced this uh, new service that they had. Now, how many compliments do you think the CEO of Delta gets? <laughs> right now? Probably not that many. <laughs> uh, how many times do you land and go, I got to tell these people this flight was just magical. Right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> so smooth those peanuts were so it was, good it was on time and those seats so luxurious those peanuts <laughs> yummy <laughs> that movie never heard of it before right? <laughs> no, they, no they get complaints all day long but if you can connect with somebody about what they care about they engage without the ask the problem is everyone's got the ask and mm -hmm. you know like the Harry Christians they used to give out the flower, but then yet it was a long conversation and you're like, uh, not worth the flower. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, uh, they're also using another key sales skill. People don't, yeah. I, I, the, uh, law of the, reciprocation. The, yeah. yeah. I, I knew there was a word for it. Reciprocation. They've given you something. So you feel you have to, you know, be nice to them and give them something. Yeah. It like taps into some kind of, lizard brain part of us where if you've done something nice for someone they want to be nice to you right and we, we tend to forget this and we turn it into a bribe 
right? It's like, hey, I sent you those cookies. You got to take my demo. Well, you don't go from cookies to demo, right? Mm -hmm. You can go to cookies to conversation. Although I have taken meetings just because someone like sent me a bottle of wine. I'm like, oh, now I've got to hear this guy out. You, you right? feel obligated, right? Well, and, and, and there's also a part of me that says like, um, like I've hired people who literally showed up at our office to like, you know, turn in their, their um, resume in person. It was a salesperson. So, you know, I, I think that that made me, it automatically made me appreciate their aggression and fearlessness. But um, I, I've, I've hired people to, uh, from doing that that turned out to be a great sales rep. Um, but, uh, but I think it, it, there's also something going on where if someone has gone that far out of their way for me to like, you know, buy me a bottle of wine or, you know, show up, show up on my doorstep, I'm like, well, you know, this is expensive for them. The, this is, there's a real reason that they're here and I, I should probably give them the time of day here. I mean, my time's not that valuable. Yeah. I, should, I should give them the five, 10 minutes, right? Right. And if you think of outward mindset or emotional intelligence, uh, have you ever gotten a present that just, it wasn't the cost, but it just touched you. It was like, it was exactly something that you appreciated. You don't need it. You weren't waiting for it. It wasn't obvious. You know, it just showed thought, caring, a little bit of effort and understanding. And, yeah. and when someone does that, and I, I've had that done and you're like, you know, it, it was a $60 present. I think I paid for it. So it wasn't the money. It was the thought. And, and then you get just the opposite, like the AJ example from Sopranos, where it's like, you know, the, the Matrix DVD is really for him. <laughs> and the mother are. knows it immediately. <laughs> She's like, do you want to see the Matrix tonight? He's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and, and so much of sales, that's really what we're doing. Are we really being thoughtful about what will help this other person? talking about what they care about and building, meeting them where they are, right? Because, you know, they may not be thinking about what we sell right now. They may not be aware it exists. They may not even feel the pain that it solves. Well, and what would you say to someone who's trying to work on their emotional intelligence or their empathy skills? How, how can they better understand what is going on in someone else's mind or your prospects organization and understand how they make decisions, understand them better so that you can do better in your interactions with them. Yeah. I mean, the, the easy hack is to go to that persona within your own company. If you sell to CFOs, go take your CFO out to lunch or coffee or bribe them for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> your CIO, your CEO, your CMO, your CRO, you know, so that you can say like, well, what do you care about? What do people like you care about? What do you hate? How do you get rewarded? Uh, what excites you? What scares the hell out of you? What do you listen to? What do you read? Whose blog do you read? Who do you follow? And then just become a student of that. Use their vocabulary. Uh, find their value system. What's their reward? What's their interest? What are they passionate about? And, and then you can start to build conversational items and look, look for symptoms around the problem that you solve. Like in your case, you ever figure out, you know, what's the best route for me today? What's the best geographic use of my time today? I don't want to think about it. I don't want to keep track of it. I don't want to monitor it. I want you guys to do that for me. Have you ever said like, where should I go next? Right. And spend a half hour trying to figure it out. And then by the time the half hour's up, the traffic's busy and you're going the wrong way. <laughs> you got to find a place for dinner or a hotel. You start talking about the symptoms around the problem. So would you ever be interested in solving that or seeing the alternatives? You can keep, you know, opening up Google Maps and trying to swipe up and down while you drive and you got your elbow on the steering wheel and your foot on. <laughs> we've got we've got to get you selling badger, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you and you try and put a little humor in because humor breaks down the 
professional pretense that we all have, right? Yeah. You get somebody laughing and all of a sudden you get that commonality. Because when you're contacting another human being, it's like, who are you? Do I know you or do I not know you? Then what do you want? Do you want to help me or you want me to help you? That's the mm -hmm. sequence we go through. And guess what? If I don't know you, not interested. If, if you want some, me to help you, get in line. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Because a uh, you know, great analogy is like, when your doorbell rings, what's the first thing you do? You look out the window or the little peepee -pee hole and you're not expecting anybody. And you see a stranger there with a book or something, you're like, mm, not home. <laughs> but if it's the FedEx guy and your new MacBook Pros two weeks early, you're like, hello, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You're like, where you been all my life? <laughs> Um, and how, how can you build that understanding? How do you learn to walk in their shoes? How do you, when you're looking at a prospect or a customer, how do you learn what motivates them? What are their pain points? How do you, how do you get inside of not just knowing stuff about them as a general role, but actually get to know them and what's going on with them? Well, they leave little crumbs all over the internet. You know, like with the, the Delta guy, I mean, it look, it was literally five minutes. I go, look, here's this press release, say this. No one's complimented this guy since he got in there, <laughs> right? We say, yeah. what a great idea. How's it working? <laughs> Replied in like 15 minutes. <laughs> and and he, was, he was emotionally intelligent enough to know our role and what we really wanted. You know, we wanted to break the ice and we wanted him to introduce as a CIO. And he copies the CIO on it. And boom. Yeah. And the CEO tells the CIO, hey, you might want to talk to these guys. You got an open conversation. Yeah, it happens all the time. It's, you know, people email me and I'm like, well, I'm obviously not the person to talk to, but I'll, I, <laughs> I forward it to, I, I generally don't copy them, but I'll forward it to the person in the organization who like, it's their area. And I'm like, oh, do you want me to introduce this guy or, or what? But yeah, so that, that can be a, an effective means of getting something in front of somebody. Right. Because how many pitches do you get a day? You know, um, they're, a they're lot. <laughs> they're, they're verbose and they're, you know, buzzword, latent. And you go, I don't know what this is. Yeah. I don't know who it is. I don't know what it does. I don't know what I should do with it. It's actually helpful because sometimes people will shoot me like, a, you know, three sentence LinkedIn email or whatever. And I'll, I'll be like in mail, I guess it's called, but they they'll, and I'll, I'll read it. I'll read the value proposition. And I know who in the organization should be looking at this. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll let them know that this exists. And I'll, and then I'll ask them if they want to be intro. So they, it, by, by dealing with me, by, by me as the gatekeeper, they had the salesperson had to boil it down to just its essence. Cause if, if you're very complex or confusing at all, I'm not even gonna understand what you're talking about on some complex technical thing. I'm like, I don't know if we use that. I have no idea. But if, if you're just, you know, descriptive, I'll know and keep it general enough that I can actually follow it. I'll be able to forward it to the right person. Yeah. And that's the best they'll get. Right. And that person who receives it goes, Oh, another message from Steve wanting me to look at her product. <laughs> Does poor, it, you know how busy I am? <laughs> the poor mar the poor marketing team, because you know, there's so much cool like Martech out there in the world that I'm always like, Hey, have you checked out this thing? They track this with this button. It's cool. Like, <laughs> well, that's it. Because we live in a world today where it's not that we don't want it, don't need it and can't afford it. It's just like, where's it on our list? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, all those no decisions, uh, status quo, it's like they can afford it. You can tell if they can afford it before you contact them. You can see if they're hiring or laying off, you know what their funding is. You can reverse engineer their financials. How many employees do they have? What's their revenue? It's not hard. You know, the budget excuse is an excuse, right? I've heard people, oh, I was trying to sell to Apple. They said, oh, they don't have any budget. <laughs> They've got a trillion dollars. dollars. <laughs> <laughs> they can find it's it. not a priority is what it is. Yeah. Well, so, well how, do you, how do you do that? How do you, when you're looking, when you're interacting with, with a prospect or a customer, 
And uh, how do you gauge how interested they are in your product or service? How do you, is it based on body languages? Is it, is it based on what they're saying or what they're not saying? Yeah. The key is to start where they are because people don't like to talk about their problems unless it's an active problem. Now, I don't know if you've been to a doctor lately, right? Let's say your knee hurts. What do you want? You want a prescription. Okay, prescription, I'll take a shot. If he says operation, you're like, eh, it doesn't hurt that bad. <laughs> <laughs> My knee's <You> fine. <laughs> you know, it's, it's raining. You know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. The doctor can't just say, yeah, it needs to be replaced or we need to do this. And like, you're like, no, it doesn't. Yeah, you well, don't believe because there's no social proof. What does he have to do? Like, well, he, he has to walk you down a path. So like, how long has it been hurting? When does it hurt? Okay, let's take an x-ray. Then he has to show you the x-ray. He say, you see this thing here? It should be attached. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it appears to be torn. Right. So the, the aspirin will get you for four hours. The shot will get you for 24 hours. You need an operation. Otherwise, it doesn't just find its way back. You know, this is something that requires. You, you have to meet them where they are and show them the path because otherwise they say I'm fine until because a good friend of mine's a cardiologist. He goes, I can't just say we got to do surgery. I got to like take x-rays. I got to show them. I got to explain if you don't do this between six months and 18 months, you're going to wake up one night and you're not going to be able to breathe and you're not going to be able to stand up. And hopefully we can get you to the hospital and then do it. And most of the time when they're in the hospital, they show the x-ray, you're not going home. Because they know if you go home, you're not coming back. Right. right? We so, got to do this now. <laughs> we got to do this now. And people, you know, are very resistant to that. Unless they're like in market and they're desirable. You can sense that. The inbound leads are pretty easy to process, right? They've already know the problem, they know you're an option. So what's important to you? What's your situation? You can tell where you fit against the alternatives. Uh, uh, let's do a trial, get you used to it, get that transfer of ownership. So now it's part of your workflow and your life. And all of a sudden it's now natural. And pulling it out is more painful than processing the paperwork to get it bought. And is this is this related to the mammal to mammal selling that you're always talking about? Uh, you yeah. know the how, how does how does mammal to mammal selling differentiate from people to people selling? Well, people don't think they react. Okay, I mean, look at all the social discourse. Is this thinking or reacting? Right, crowds think. You know all this whatever pops into their head, an emotional response, you know, on both sides. It makes no sense. In two cases, one was about sleeping in a parking lot. The other is about, you know, $20 of cigarettes. Is that worth any of this? It escalates. People react. No one's thinking. If you were thinking, like, run home, go away. <laughs> you know what's up? Sure. Right? <laughs> But we're mammals. We, uh, it's, we are it, mammals. It's funny. I, a dog ownership teaches you this. Like they have the same emotional circuitry that we do. And obviously like, you know, monkeys and stuff do, but you, when you own a dog, you can see them. They just, they react like they, they react with emotion and it's the same emotions that we have. They are. And we, we can choose, we can choose to only act on those emotions or we can cho choose to think things through. But, uh, right. I mean, we, we do have a prefrontal cortex but you got to understand that's 5% of our brain power. So it's 5% against 95. Guess who wins? Mm -hmm. All right. Does anybody not know how to lose weight? So, so you're saying the mammal side, the instinct side and the reactive side, that's the 95 and the 5% the is the, is the, the, the thought part, the logic part yeah. is, is EI, or instincts involved in one, but not the other, or does it does it touch Absolutely. both to some degree? Absolutely, right. You never wake up at three in the morning going, "I hope I have some leftover kale shake in the fridge." 
Right? <laughs> you wake up and you go, I bet there's some of that pizza, that lasagna, that chocolate cake, something sweet and savory and salty. Mm -hmm. Right? EQ and outward mindset is 100% prefrontal cortex. That's why it's so hard. It takes conscious effort, repetition. It's not knowing, it's doing. Everyone reads a book about EQ and they think they know what it is. And they do. They just can't apply it because it's hard. What's right? interesting is some of the smartest people I know have some of the worst emotional intelligence that I've <laughs> of anyone I've run into. <laughs> well, think about it. How do you get smart IQ? It's not being with other people. It's being by yourself, programming, reading, studying. And how do you develop social skills? You know, when I was an engineer, you know, it would be go three or four days before I talked to somebody. And yeah. I opened my mouth and it, it was like a little bit of learning curve there. <laughs> You just sure. no interaction, your, your, your head, and it was great. You're in the zone, you're in the flow, but to connect with another human being requires you like, what are they going through right now? Right? And like when they're getting cut off in traffic, they didn't plan that. Maybe, maybe they're going to the hospital to see a dying parent. Mm -hmm. Maybe something just bad happened to them and they didn't have the consideration to put their blinker on. And what is the best way for a salesperson to train their mind to react in the moment with emotional intelligence, to, to have their go-to thought after someone cuts them off being like, oh, they're probably really distracted and stressed out and that's why they're a terrible driver. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you get, how do you train your mind to do that instead of like shaking your fist and, and yelling at your windshield? Yeah, You kind of have to like future pace it. It's like if you future pay somebody, hang up on you and just say, no problem. Next one. Now, what, what does that mean? Know, future pace, future pace, anticipate it. Okay. Anticipate. So no, knowing that it can happen means that when it does happen, it doesn't bother you. Right. Give it a different meaning. Okay. You know, because I, I post a lot on social and you get all kinds of people hating it, misinterpreting it, uh, spamming promoting their own stuff, hijacking the post. Mm -hmm. And if you use your mammal brain, you're going to get kicked off LinkedIn. <laughs> <You're> just... <laughs> right? Yeah, I had some. Because if you say what's really feeling. <laughs> most people uh, watch these, most people listen to these podcasts on, on like podcast platforms, but we also put them on, on YouTube. And someone like in the comments section was like, making fun of me for being pasty and not tan. And I was like, oh man, come on. <laughs> like, I'm just, oh, that's just the nicest things I've heard. <laughs> just teaching you about sales over here. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> but that shows you about that unconscious mammal brain because they're not listening to the podcast, hearing what's being said, internalizing. What does it mean? How can I use it? They're reacting to the image, what you're wearing, uh, the background, uh, whatever, whatever they, they want to hate on or the, the immediate impulse. I just put one about selling a pen. Of course, the immediate impact for most people was Wolf of Wall Street. I go, okay, the video has nothing to do with that at all. <laughs> But it was, like, it was a, a classic good, thing to say before they said it in Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> right. And it was more like, how do you use it during an interview if you get the question to get the other person to tell you what they really want to hear from you and then get the offer? But, you know, people didn't watch the video. They read the title and they just have a knee jerk reaction. You know, and, and this is what happens to us. You know, it, we, we don't think we react so you got to anticipate how someone going to react to this not think about it they're not going to really contemplate your pitch so that's why you got to get them talking you know, well, talking it, about this, the symptoms it makes me think of objections and objection handling what would you recommend how does ei relate to objections and objection handling it, 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 well you, you can only get an objection if you're proposing something Mm -hmm. 
if you're asking, right? Like, what do you care about? What are you up against? Uh, how do you feel when this happens? You ever notice this? What we hear is this and you get them talking. You don't ask for 15 minutes of their time, right? You don't ask for a demo. You say, any interest in seeing this? Right? They're not going to say it's too much. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, so it, only in the rare case where they just want to get rid of you completely, they say, I got no budget. Right. It's just like, I don't want to hear anything from anybody. Okay. But you, you got to start where they are. And most likely they're unaware of the problem that you solve. So you got to start there and build awareness about the problem by developing symptoms of what, that are affected by the problem. And then all of a sudden now they're open to it. And they go, have you ever looked at alternatives to solve this? Are you curious about what's out there? And kind of build this rapport. And when I say rapport, it's not about talking about the fish on the wall. It's, it's starting where they are with questions and curiosity and interest about what they're up against. And how about the other way when something's not going well? How do you know when to walk away from a deal? Does, does EI give you can, you, can you put yourself in the other person's shoes and be in touch with your emotions to get better signals on when yeah. something's yeah. just worth walking from? Absolutely, because people don't like to give bad news, right? When, when you're, you know, if you're not going to hire somebody, just say, we put that role on hold. When you're pitching an investor, they go, well, come back to us in three months and give us an update. They don't say no, right? But they are saying no. <laughs> They're not giving you money. <laughs> yes. You know, it's a definite maybe, which is a no today. <laughs> And it takes emotional intelligence to read that. Like, is this person not lying, but not completely accurate information? It's like the no decision. Yeah, there is a decision. You're not getting an order. That's a just go down to the bank with the no decision and see what you can get. Nothing. <laughs> Tough to deposit that. <laughs> yeah, no decision. <laughs> what about and, and we don't want to hear it either. Right. Right. We don't. Um, you know? Yes. Yeah, so if you're listening, to, if you're listening to the emotions, you can be better tuned in and know when to walk because they might not just tell you with, they might not tell your logical brain, but they, they've already told your, your, your mammal brain. Right. If they're unwilling to have a, you know, a follow up call in two weeks for five minutes and they say, Oh, we're, we're busy. I'll get back to you. That means they're not interested. You know, uh, we, uh, you always use like dating as a great analogy. You know, if somebody's sure. washing their hair on Saturday night, it, she's just not that into you. I mean, if I have spent, spent a lot of time on my hair. I mean, sometimes just yeah. Saturday, I, you know, I wake it's up. It's time day, consuming. Yeah, I mean, by the end of the day, you know. You, you got to work on the skin though. Right? You yeah. get the tanner. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm working on both of those things. You know, given the feedback of my, my YouTube detractors. <laughs> um, so so how do you uh how about building trust how can you better use emotional intelligence skills to build trust with prospects because i mean what is trust and when do you trust somebody it's when you feel that the other person has your interest above theirs okay like to think about who would you trust with the keys to your house when you go away on vacation? Is it your crazy party or brother who you've known all your life? Or is it your neighbor who like pulls your papers in when you're away without asking waters your plants without asking, you know, somebody who does looks out for you, gives you a heads up when something's going on. Yeah, I, I uh, was traveling. It was about a year ago, and I had a uh, an employee. I was I was in my Spain office, and I had an employee from our Philippines office in, and they were staying at my place in San Francisco because I was gone for you know three weeks to to Europe, and uh, 
and literally the sink exploded like the they did their laundry or something i'm not even sure how, it might have just been a backup from the street i'm not sure how it happened but like the sink in the laundry room just like flooded the whole uh the whole area so i, I was just lucky someone was staying there when uh, <laughs> when this because i, I would have come back three weeks later and the whole house would have been run in water and that's it and that's a, as salespeople, we do almost everything to break trust we push um, we, we focus on what we need, the timings about our priorities, not theirs. We don't, don't ask questions. We don't offer help. We only want updates. And yeah. what I hear quite often from managers is my reps don't seem to care. And it's like, well, you're probably putting them through this cadence where they don't have time to care. And people sense it. Yeah, I, I uh, one of one of my tricks to have when, when I was a rep, one of the reasons I was successful is because my my managers, because I was already selling a lot, weren't holding a gun to my head, telling me to drag crazy deals in this quarter at the end of the quarter to like make my number, and so I was able to close them on their natural timeline, which might have been two months later, it might have been five months later, but by letting it close in its natural timeline, I was able to close it for much more money and I didn't have to like, you know, do crazy giveaways to drag it to, to drag it into the quarter. And, and, and so I stay, it's like I stayed ahead because I was ahead, you know? Yeah. And you're right. And you communicate with the people, you help them, you answer their questions, you get them support, you show them what the product can really do. And you're passionate about helping them be more successful at their job. And that comes across. Instead Absolutely. of like, let me show you all hundred features. It'll only be three hours. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to love it. Uh, <laughs> Get some popcorn. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, uh, we, I, I advise to everyone to get a great, have the, one of your best reps at demoing, do a great demo video, record it, edit, edit it, like make it super, super tight, have it scripted and put that on your website because it's better than any, it, it's, it's, it's great for people to be able to get a demo, you know, before they get on the phone with, with one of your reps. It just takes, saves the rep time, saves, saves the, the customer time. And it's, I think it comes from a place of empathizing with the customer that like, they want just like a succinct answer and a succinct, when they, when they ask themselves, what's this product look like? It'd be, it's great to get like a succinct, awesome, tight demo that they can just like jump online on their, on their phone whenever, you know, when they're sitting on the train or whatever. And, and see the basics of rather than having to go through all the rigmarole. If they've got more questions, then, then it's time to go deeper. But That's it. And if you can ask yourself, how do I demonstrate I have their interest in mind above mine? Yeah. And, and when you break that, you can't, it's very hard to repair. So the next section is sales in 60 seconds. So quick questions, quick answers. First question is, what is the one question you should ask all your prospects? Oh, what do they care about most? What's important to them? What are they up against? You know, something around the problem that you solve, not the product you sell. Yeah, that was How lesson number today? one. And that was lesson number one in IBM sales training that I went through in, what was that, 2007? <laughs> um, Everybody talks about the product, the company, them. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about, you know, what is the problem that you solve? Sell that. Then the product becomes easy. Yeah. Now, other than that skill, what what is something that differentiates a good salesperson from a great salesperson? A great salesperson can anticipate what's going to happen so that they can prevent the deal from getting stuck because deals have a certain pattern, especially large complex deals. Everything's nice and rosy until they have to get it through the system. Having it being identified as something that they want to buy, that's the easy part. Even the money isn't that hard. It's the politics and the administration that get stuck. And it usually dies 
uh, one of three ways. You know, some mysterious person has to be involved that no one ever heard of, advisory board, board of directors, specialists, standards committee, all of a sudden pops up. And all of a sudden, now you have to start the deal over with them. Or they, they go from an enterprise license to a single seat license. <laughs> right? So you just spent six months to get a tiny deal. Or they just decide to back burner it. It's just too hard to get it done. And it's like, uh, we'll look at it next quarter. So all of these things are going to happen. So it's up to us to keep the direction and momentum and control of the deal moving straight forward. Yeah, I was, I was uh, selling one of the biggest deals of my life um, to a big pharmaceutical company, one of the major, you know, one of the big five pharma companies. And it, me and, my, and one of my engineers in, in the room, um, you know, talking, talking about how Badger would, would help their, them sell more and organize their sales force, yada, yada, yada. And they, they, like the 17 executives seem to all be on board with the concept that we would be extremely helpful to their organization. And like all, all of our value propositions were like checking the boxes for them. But what they did, what, what no one could agree on was whose department and which part of the organization would run this slash get the credit slash like control it slash who owns the, you know, all the, it was all just their internal bickering and like, yes. and, and literally the whole, it was like a three hour meeting and probably 20 minutes of it was about us. The rest was just like them and their internal morass that they had to, <laughs> they had to wade through and they did not end up doing anything. They were just, you know, there, it was, well, it looks like we're gonna have to have another meeting to try to figure out who, you know, they just, it just slid sideways and there was nothing. We tried to get the, keep the thing on track and, but no, it, it, that did not work. And, and that's not the exception. That's kind of the rule in certain size deals which typically you're doing a big deal with a big company mm -hmm. and nobody goes to decision-making school inside that company, nor how to automate the company or how to spend the company's money. Right. That's orthogonal. They, they teach you how not to spend the company's money. <laughs> well, what's, you know, and it's funny, it, it wasn't even about the money. Like it wasn't about no. the value they would receive and it wasn't about the cost. It was pure. I mean, they're a pharma company. They, they, print money, right? They sell little bits of chemicals and expensive pill bottles, but they, they, it was just like politics almost. It was like, you know, it is this, politics. It was the IT department versus the sales operations department versus the, the, the sales management department, you know, like it was, it was right. Who's going to run training? Who's going to support it? Who's going to maintain it? Who's going to administrate the updates? Who's yeah. going to all these little nits. And yeah. these people who their whole job is to cover that one little piece and fight for their little thiefdom. Either they want it or they don't want it. That <laughs> responsibility, not the product. I, I used to, uh, when I was at Google, one of the products I sold was, was Google Apps. And uh, so very commonly we were replacing like Lotus Notes installations with Gmail. And, you know, Lotus is historically not the best email program, obviously. It's, it's all you know, Microsoft, Microsoft and, and Google at this point. But... Um, there was always like, you know, it, if we're replacing a Lotus deal, there's, there's some Lotus notes administrator whose title is literally something like Lotus notes administrator. <laughs> like that person's in the room and I'm at the front being like, and you're going to save a ton of money by getting rid of right. Lotus notes. <laughs> like, you think that guy? <laughs> <This guy. laughs> <laughs> and he's like, do I want to learn something new? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the class, it's all, it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, all that stuff that you're like, you know, you, you, have to really work to keep, you, know, <laughs> you got to work to keep all those servers standing. They fall over their emails out for three days. No longer Google's servers don't fall over. We, you know, it's all mirrored and backed up and you know, don't have to, don't have to spend any time on that. That guy did not like that. He was like, well, <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause it's change helps some people hurt some people no matter what mm -hmm. and if you're so, not un oh go ahead go ahead sorry yeah and if you're unaware of that you're just smiling the roi makes sense mm -hmm. right of course they're gonna do it yeah why wouldn't they yeah. <laughs> well the lotus notes guy has a reason trust me so that, that's something we have yeah. to think about as salespeople for sure right and, and if you're up in the seven figures it goes to the board and if you don't if you have like the chairman 
or a board member is on the board of a competitor, guess what's going to happen? They're going to like, Absolutely. did you look at us? <laughs> Take a second look. They call yeah. the CEO. He goes, what? We're losing? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And what, what about listening? What, what makes a salesperson a good listener? If you're asking yourself, what's the meaning behind the words? Instead of the words, people can hear the words, but what's the meaning? And th this is what like the AI conversational intelligence people don't get is that they just follow the words. It's not the pauses between the words. It's not which words and, and which words show understanding versus confusion, which words show caution versus enthusiasm. Uh, well, they also, I think this is something that we miss in general as salespeople. We're not able to get face to face with someone. There's so much of communication isn't even just in the words. Body it's language. in the way their eye, the way someone's eye looks or how they look at the, how they look at the other guy when you say the price or how, you know, like all these things. Well, I, yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm a big mystery fan and there's a, a, do a documentary on Showtime now called Outcry. Mm-hmm. And I'm watching this guy who's going to prison for 25 years. And I go, maybe I'm crazy, but I don't think he's lying. Yeah. And we have intuition around these things, right? We really, we have, well, we, we, we I call see. it a bullshit meter. Yeah, sure. Right. It, because when your salary or your income is based off of the truth that the other person, your decisions are based off of what they're telling you. And mm -hmm. you're like, ah, and you get this, you know, you hear like a person on the first meeting talk about an enterprise deal. And you're like, ah, that's a little premature for that. <laughs> right, right. There should be a lot of push before that com word comes up. Yeah, it can be, it can, it, it's, it, it's all, I feel like it's so much harder to do. And you, you can even do it just seeing someone on a TV, like you're saying, it, being in a room and seeing the dynamics, I, 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 I uh, I'm not, I'm not doing a good job with my sales in 60 seconds rules here, but I've got a quick story on this. <laughs> I, was, I was doing like a, it was, I think it was a $1.3 million deal. Um, and I was, I was selling Google maps at the time. And uh, so the Google maps API and um, this, this company, big tech company, and they, they had about 17 installations of Google across their organization, and uh, and they they had just decided that they uh, Google had decided it was going to start charging everyone uh, if a, if a company was using like Google in a lot of places, then it was going to put them over, and they couldn't use the free. They they had to start paying for it, and this is like a policy change, right? So basically, these guys had always had this for free, and I was going and they're saying, "Yeah, you you owe me one point five million dollars." Ended up being one point three, but <laughs> um, but the uh, but I like my I, I was there with my manager at the time, and I remember I remember him being like um, like they 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 were basically telling us we're gonna rip you rip rip this all out of here we're gonna use this other product instead you know this is this is total BS that you guys are are trying to charge us for this we've always used it for you you know we're huge customers of you on you know your actual business over here the ad side like. We're we're gonna rip this out. All that we're you know we can't pay for this. We didn't plan for this. We had no budget for it. And and we and, and I saw one of the product engineers look at one of the. There were like probably fifteen people in the meeting, and, and and I saw one of the product engineers look at one of the other product engineers and like not roll his eyes, but like when when the guy was like, "We're gonna rip this all out of here," he was like looked at his buddy. He was like, "Yeah, we are." Like, and I knew I was there like, oh no, you guys are paying us. There is no way. <laughs> like I saw a look on the engineer's face, like, yeah, we're going to replace that 17 times. Did, did, did right. you give me a team of six guys to do that for the next year? <laughs> because and, you're, you're looking for the tells from the other people. Yeah. But it had, had to be in the room for that one. <laughs> and that's it. Because if you listen to just the words, you'd be like, okay, but how about 600 K? Right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's exactly my, 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 my manager and I went out to the parking lot and he was like, we should, we should just drop our pants on this. We should, uh, we should give it to him for like 200 K or something, take the money off the table. 
And I was like, let me, let me negotiate this out. Give me, give me a couple months. Let me do this. And, uh, and that, you know, that was, that was the difference between a, a good year and a great year for me. Right. It was a big, it's yeah. a big spread, extra million bucks. Right. Because you knew the reality. Yeah. You know, and, if you and, watch and, these murder shows, you can just see. Mm-hmm. And, and most people yeah, aren't great people, liars, right? Most, people are terrible liars. <laughs> you, people, people are, yeah, they're not good at it. So, you know, if you, if you, especially if you have had a career in sales, you often have gut instincts about, is this person BSing me or is this, is, is this on the level? Um, so what is your top tip for being empathetic and thinking like a prospect? How do you, what would you say, what would you tell a rep that, that is trying to just get started in their, their empathy training? The first is to start being curious. Ask yourself, what don't I know? Because no matter how much we know, we're, it's still incomplete, right? Even twins can't read each other's minds. What right. don't I know about this account? If you start asking yourself those questions, you'll naturally become more curious. What do I wish I knew? What question would help me answer that without being too overt? Curiosity is the key to empathy. That, that, might, that might be the headline of this show. <laughs> it is. I love it. Well, I'm going to attempt to uh, summarize everything that we've talked about today. Um, no promises that I get all the important stuff, but I'll, I'll try to run through it in two minutes here. Um, so first, it's, it's really important to have an outward mindset and to know both your customer and yourself. No. The ability to connect with another human being is not necessarily something we're born with. It's something we learn. It's something we're socialized into. It's important to show your prospects that you're curious about them and you, it's important that you connect with them over something that they care about. So this outward mindset is, it, it's all about taking a step back and taking the time to learn about what your customer's days are like and understand what their needs are. Be really thoughtful about what will help your prospects and meet them where they are. Get an inside view into your prospects' problems and motivations by talking with someone that you know uh, in your company or a friend or a, someone in your network that fits the persona of your ideal prospects and ask them what their interests are, what motivates them, what problems they face, what they're scared of. Uh, know your customer as well as you know yourself or better and, and, uh, and, and that's, that's the way you can start walking around in their shoes. Um, EI or EQ, um, emotional intelligence is hard because it takes continuous effort and repetition. Get your prospects talking about the different issues they're facing and listen to their emotions. So that way you can understand what their symptoms are of their problem and, and you can start to develop rapport by empath empathizing with those, with those problems and, and the symptoms of those problems. You have a good memory. <laughs> <laughs> I take notes. <laughs> I actually have a terrible memory. <laughs> but uh, so uh, build trust with prospects by showing them that you'd put their interests above your own interests. This has been fantastic, Brian. I mean, this is such powerful stuff. And I, I think the all the great salespeople do this, even if they're not even conscious of it. They're just, you know, they, they just were taught to be empathetic at a young age. And now, now it's just a muscle they, they, they flex and they don't even realize it. But um, what you're saying is so important. Where, where can listeners read more about your work and how can they reach out to you? How do they learn more of what you teach? Um, I'm super active on LinkedIn, Brian G. Burns on LinkedIn and check out the brutal truth about sales and selling podcast. Awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming in today, Brian. Uh, this has been a great episode of the outside sales talk. If anyone can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from polishing up on their emotional intelligence skills, uh, share this podcast with them. Um, 
take care until next, next time, everybody. And thanks a lot for coming in, Brian.